All right, so I'm Nate Edwards. Jaron's going to be coming up. We're just going to keep this pretty informal. Um, again, we're going to be presenting on student mentorship, or you can replace students with interns, whatever you want. We don't claim to be the authorities on this by any means. We have a system that we feel like works, um, works well for us. Our students are great. And uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of questions that were submitted on Facebook that we'll be addressing, and uh, any questions that you guys have as well. But let's keep it pretty informal. If you guys have questions, raise your hands. Let's just kind of have a discussion about it. So uh, Jaron, if you want to go ahead and start us off. Yeah. Well, and we're really grateful that we were asked to speak on this topic. It's something that obviously we're passionate about. We talk, it seems like, well, we can't shut up about it, right? But we love our students, and we love what they do. And the reason that I'm so passionate about mentoring is I'm the product of mentoring. If it weren't for Mark Philbrick, I wouldn't be here, right? He, as I was hired as a student at BYU Photo, uh, I, I was trying to apply to the photo program, and he just laughed, and he's like, you don't need to do that. I'll teach you everything you need to know, right? And that's exactly what he did. And I'm, I'm grateful for that mentorship. And that's why I, I believe in mentoring. And honestly, if there's a group of photographers in the world that should believe in mentoring, it's us. Education's in our name. It should be in our DNA. We should be passionate about bringing that next generation of photographers uh, to take over for us someday, right? So I, I believe that there's a lot of power in mentoring. I believe it, that in mentoring, well, let's just say this. In 30 or 40 years, nobody's going to care about my photos. But the lives that I affect through my mentoring are going to affect the generations. And that's why I'm passionate about mentoring. Yeah. And one thing I would, I would suggest, and again, not because we are full of wisdom. That's not, that's not, one, that's not the case. Two, that's not what I mean. But hopefully during this discussion, you guys will have ideas come to your mind of things that you can incorporate. So I strongly recommend to take notes, whether digitally or with a pen just to be ready. So you'll have thoughts, impressions come to you. Make sure to write those down and make sure to act on those when you get back. Uh, so we're going to show a little video. Kind of last minute, we asked our students to answer a couple questions. And so this is one, some of our previous students that have graduated, moved on, have their prof professional careers right now. And we just asked them the question, like what's the difference to them between a mentor and a boss? So this is kind of their, uh, their answers here. Having a boss is really just checking the boxes of making sure you're coming into work and getting your work done. But having a mentor is having that side of things, but also pushing you as an individual to become better in your craft. For me, mentorship requires an investment of time, energy, and genuine care in someone that you're working with. A boss oversees tasks to completion while a mentor is, is not a taskmaster. The biggest difference I saw between having a boss and having a mentoring experience was the level of trust between us. I feel like having a mentor is much more important to me than having a boss. In a mentorship, I feel like there's more trust. And with that higher level of trust, that allows for more growth opportunities and opportunities to really refine who you are as an employee or as a mentor or in your profession. They really cared about me as an individual and as well as my craft and listened to me and really pushed me in ways that made me excel and learn. A boss can't wait for the training to be done. A mentor realizes there's always training to be done. For example, at BYU Photo, my mentors were always willing to answer any questions I had, take time to explain concepts to me and were generally just like invested in my growth and progress, both as a professional and as a person. And I really appreciated that. With a boss, the goal is to have a specific task completed, but in a mentoring situation, the whole purpose is to train a student so they can confidently complete any project. Having a mentor is someone that believes in you and pushes you to be better and to improve. And I think a boss is just someone that is, is, has expectations for you to get things done. And so there's no amount of like wanting you to exceed those and to improve and to grow. And I think just really believing in you that often more than we believe in ourselves. A boss holds all the power. A mentor gives all their power. 
But for that to happen, bosses need to trust their students and be willing to give them harder projects so they can grow their skills. Once the student gains confidence, they will actually make your job easier because they can take meaningful projects off your to-do list. I think anyone can be a boss, anyone can manage timelines and tell people what they need to do, but in order to be considered a mentor, you really need to be willing to invest in the people that you work with. All right, so I'm just going to ask the question to you guys, what do you feel like mentoring is? We heard from some of our previous students and kind of their thoughts and feelings on it, but what were some things that stood out, the difference between having a, mo a boss and a mentor, um, either with them or the thoughts that you guys have? Just go ahead and throw it out. Level of trust, sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge. Investing, in their future. investing in their future. Sometimes it's not always about the job or the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's about life and other things going on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of those. So one, investing in their future. Um, man, so much of mentorship is, I, I don't know, for, for us in our situation, I think our care for our students goes far beyond. Our, our job is not just to take photos for the university, but what can we do with these students to really prepare them for when they leave the university? Uh, what can we do to help them along the way? That's such a huge part of it. Um, what were some of the other comments we just said? Sorry, my mind's going blank. You get in front of a bunch of people and you just, you know. What were some of the other things that were said? I like, I like the boss gives power. I mean, a, a boss uses power. I don't know exactly how he said it. A boss uses power, a mentor gives power. Yeah, what, what, what did you like about that? What were your thoughts? Well, it makes a lot of sense. Like, um, I feel like the, the, if you have a, an intern that you can trust, that, that you can literally give power to make decisions, like that they can you send them out on an assignment and you trust them to make decisions, that's, that's giving them power to create, power to make, literally make decisions, to think on their feet, to be creative, to, um, and that you're not, you might have critique of their work when they come back, but you're not controlling them, you're not putting your power over them, you're not saying, well, I'm better, bigger, better, faster, stronger, smarter, whatever, and, and giving that to them is a lot like the whole person thing, like, I believe in you, you're here for a reason, you belong here. Yeah. And that yeah. seems more powerful and more important to me than USA. Yeah, I love that. Think about experiences where that's happened to us individually, where somebody has empowered us and trusted us and giving us, given us responsibility. Uh, man, you really want to, you really want to live up to that expectation and that, that trust that they're giving you, right? What are some other thoughts? Feel, thoughts of mentorship, the difference. I always found that being a mentor is this weird mix of being a boss, a colleague, and even if sometimes a friend. Yeah. But you have to have the right parts and at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because they need a boss, right? Yeah. Yes, we're their boss. They need responsibilities. They need expectations. They need all of that. But they also need somebody who cares about them, shows interest, not in just the work that they're doing, but in their life. Because... The thing that I've realized about mentorship is it's not our decision to be a mentor or not. Like, we can, we can do what's in our control, right? We can try to create an environment. We can care about the people that we're with. We can do all of that. But it's their decision for us to be their mentor. It's not ours. You can't just be like, hey, I'm going to be your mentor. Come work with me, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's their decision. And so the only thing we can do is try to put ourselves in a situation where they would even want us to be their mentor. Um, one of the things that was talked about, too, is it's an investment. So up front, yeah, it's hard, right? You have a new student, a new freshman coming in, and, uh, and there's a lot of work to do to train them and to get them up to speed so you feel comfortable sending them out on their own. But once that happens, one, you can send them out on their own and then we can be home with our wives, you know, at least a couple nights a week. And then two, once they're in that situation and you're hiring more students, they can also participate in that training process. And they have a unique perspective because they were once there in that situation not too long ago. And so they know kind of what those students need. 
Like yeah, that. right now, at this moment, BYU football recruiting, I mean, uh, media day is happening. I've got two students covering it, and I'm not worried. Imagine what that feels like. It's amazing. Uh, but, th but they've done the work, they're ready, we trust them, and they're empowered to go do that. So I think it's, I think it's really, it's, it's been a great experience working with them, so to get them to that point. Uh, we're gonna just go through some of the questions that we got, and please, if you have questions, we'll, we'll answer those. We'll also have some time at the end to answer questions. Number one question I think we get, how do you find good students? And <laughs> that's a hard one, right? Um, we're really lucky at BYU, we have a lot of great students, uh, but how do you guys find people that are the right fit, that fit the culture that you need um, first of all, I love people that are proactive. Uh, out of the blue, people will just reach out to us and say, I've been following BYU Photo on Instagram for 10 years. I've always wanted to work there. What does it take? Anybody that reaches out to us that's proactive, we say, send us a resume and a portfolio. We put them in a folder. As soon as we have an opening, they're the first ones we interview. And I love people that are just, they'll, 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 they'll get past the fear and go and ask. Because it scares them to death to go out and reach out to us. Um, but I love that, and that's really good. Can I add to that? So Jaron mentioned they find us on Instagram. How many of you guys have your own like photo Instagram or are able to? For your office, not, not your personal, but your office. Yeah, so that is huge. I mean, one, there's a lot of reasons university-wise why we feel it's important to have that, but two, when the students see the work and they come to the university, they wanna work there, that is a huge recruiting tool for us. One, because we're posting our students' work and we're showing behind the scenes of what our students are doing. And so people want to work there. And so that's one of the big things of part of our recruiting. Absolutely. The, the profile, having your profile there, it's really important. Uh, once that happens, uh, once we have an opening, we'll, we'll bring those people in. Sometimes we'll take our word of mouth. Our students will like, hey, I know this great student, or I know this person that's been asking me about it, and we'll ask for references from them. And every once in a while, we'll go and open it up on Instagram. We will rarely go to the campus and say, hey, we're going to put a job opening. We'll just put it on Instagram. If they're following us, they're probably the kind of person that we want to be with us, right? Uh, hi, hi, hire people that like you. Um, but those are usually the people that we bring in for the interview process. We do it a little bit differently. This is something that, I, that I, I've, take, I've uh, continued from Mark Philbrick. Um, we will bring them in. Me and Nate will sit down and do a first round interview of about 10, 15 minutes. And it's really simple. It's really short. And I'm just trying to get a sense for their personality. I do not generally hire the most qualified person, especially photographers. I am, I am not looking for that skill. I'm looking for personality. I can teach anybody photography. I cannot teach personality. I cannot teach attitude. Attitude is everything. I need people that are humble and that are hardworking. I need people that are hungry. I need people that want to come to work and want to get better, want to be me someday. That's what I need. People that want to just live the life of a photographer, that just eat and drink and sleep it. So that first round interview, we just get a sense of what they, what they want to accomplish, what their goals are. And uh, it's really good to just kind of go through those first round interviews and get that done. And then the second round, we're not going to send this video to HR. Uh, our students do the second round interviews. We don't. We bring them in, the interview candidates, and sit them down with the, our, our group of students, and we let them interview get a sense for what they're like, see if they fit. And they give us feedback, say, man, this person I think would be great. This person, I don't know, they're weird, you know? Um, <laughs> but it's actually really good. It's helpful for us to get a sense of like, these are the people they're gonna be spending most of their time with, not me and Nate, we're out working, right? Uh, and those students always give us great feedback, great insight on these candidates that come to us. And then finally, the third round, that's when we kind of get a little bit more in depth, we'll spend more time with them, we'll, we'll talk to them. Again, we're looking for people that want to learn. Um, I, I often will just, I often will mention in the first round interview, like a website they should go check out. I ask them in the third round, did they go check it out? I like people that follow through with and do what they say they're gonna do, right? Um, that accountability, it's everything, it, it's everything. And we let them know our expectations in the interview process. We've heard, and, and nothing against what's, what other people have done, but we've heard some people say, I can't even get our students to show up for work. Well, what are your expectations? What expectations were set for them initially. So even from right off the bat, we set our expectations. We have our students set their hours. You know, we're, they're expected to work X amount of hours a week. We work around your schedule. We do expect to have some availability nights and weekends to cover athletic events or banquets or whatever it is. So they know right off the bat, hey, these are the expectations that we have. We tell them too, hey, we're not looking for the best photographer. Like, we're looking for attitude, character, behavior, those who really want to be here, those who are invested, really want to work. It doesn't mean that you give your life to this. I mean, obviously, their schooling for us is number one, but we want somebody who wants to be there. 
for sure. Uh, and, and, and like Nate said, we, they work about 18 to 20 hours a week. Um, we try to make it, balance it out so that they have time to do their classes, they have their time to study, and then we try to keep it so there's at least one student on call at all times with us. So if we have a last second photo shoot or whatnot, or we need somebody to cover the portrait studio, we try to make that happen with eight students right now. It's usually okay, but there's a few times it's not. Um, and then we, they commit to it. We won't hire them until they make a commitment. And we tell them right up, if you, can't, if you don't live up to what you commit, we'll find somebody else. Uh, and we have not had very many problems. We've been very, very positive. Yep. Okay, another question we had about our onboarding process and curriculum with our new students. So onboarding, we have, this is probably the most boring part of when a student gets hired, and they probably don't understand any of it, but we have a student manual, a digital manual, that we've essentially written down every responsibility in the office, from how to talk on the phone, you know, when people call. I don't like talking on the phone. I hate answering the phone. Our phone rings all the time, so our students do all of that. So we talk about phone etiquette in there. We talk about the shoot log. Some of you are familiar with our shoot log. We have all of our processes written in there. We have contacts of everything. So everything that they need to know is contained in this manual. That's one of the first things they do is just read through this manual. It probably doesn't make any sense to them, but at least they know when they have questions, that's a place that they can go back to to familiarize themselves with it. The other nice thing we mentioned earlier is our senior students, not senior in, you know, they're seniors in school, but they've been there for a while. They take a huge part of training the new students, especially come fall time. Me and Jaron are not in the office a lot. Just it is a super busy period of time. And so that's the benefit of investing in training your students because then your older ones can train the newer ones when you're not able to be there. That is a huge part. We have a kind of a training checklist. So we have all the different sports on there. We have portraits on there, different lighting. Um, there's all sorts of different things. So, and this is something that we've been trying out kind of new. We're not super consistent at it, but it's helped us at least be organized where the students know exactly what they need to be trained on. And then we sign off on it or one of the other students sign off on it. And so if they're sitting around and they're like, I don't know what to do, Oh, we'll refer back to your list of things you need to be trained on if there's any downtime. Um, and then, oh yeah, part of our training too is our YouTube videos. So we make YouTube videos and we kind of put that into our training curriculum. So, you know, if it's learning lighting or just the general workflow from the shoot to ingest to metadata um, to you know, batch processing, saving, uploading on our server, on our photo shelter site. So all of that stuff is included. And we're continuing to add to that as well. And we include the students in the creation of those trainings. Uh, one, so they know it better. And then two, so it takes work off of us as well. Someone have a question? No, please. I'm not trying to like copy you guys or anything. No. These videos, yeah, so they're on our BYU Photo YouTube channel. What are your, what are your feelings about uh, other universities saying to their students, hey, look at, look at BYU? We will take your views any day. <laughs> <laughs> Send them our way. Absolutely. Yeah, if you need anything, please just reach out to us. Yeah, no. That's, that's why we're putting them there. I'll tell you, from an overworked staff of one person, you know, is juggling a lot of responsibilities, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of people in this room. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I definitely understand that. And, and for the most part, we don't either. But luckily, during the summertime, it slows down. And th those are times that we can use our students and we, do, and we shoot those videos. And then hopefully, we have time to edit them then. Or throughout the year, if there is downtime, OK, we need to get this video edited so we can, so we can put it out. But yeah, uh, I mean, that's why we're putting them there for whoever can use them, whoever can benefit. Go for it. Uh, it, it varies right now. It was so busy last year, we had eight students for the whole fall winter. Um, usually it's between five to seven, um, but it just kind of depends. It seems like the workload gets increased every year, and uh, they'll let us hire students to, to help us with that workload. It's, it's great. Do you pay them? Uh, they, yes, yeah, so we don't do internships. They're, they are paid. I believe that if you're going to work, you should be paid. Um, 
and, and we pay them pretty well. You know that we do raises every year on merit, and uh, yeah, it, it, I think I feel like they're some of the better paid students on campus because they've got a very technical job. Yes. Oh, our gear. Never we're going to ask them to use their gear. If they want to, they're more than welcome to, but it's ours. We're, yep. we, we have better stuff. So, <laughs> Yes, Glenn. Glenn. How does this translate to training or mentoring? Perfect transition. <laughs> training. Yeah, well, that was two parts. Okay, go give me the second part. The second part is, do you use this on me or do they use it on you? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's circular, Glenn. Um, Training, that's the, the question is, do you have team? Oh, sorry, what was the question? Just going back to recruiting a little bit, how did you start with those first students? Because it's, it's, it's ingenious to have students interview the students. Yeah. You've already built that culture. How did you start that culture? I don't know. It happened before I got there. Um, and, and I, I was one of the, then. when I started working there, we had two students. Um, and we were part of the process. I, we didn't do the formal interview. We kind of listened in and, and gave some feedback. but. Once you have one, it, it get, the ball gets rolling. So it's just, uh, again, attitude. Everything, everything comes, uh, photographers are arrogant. That's what we are, admit it. I want you to look at my picture and I want you to like it. I don't want any lip, right? That's what we do for a living. We want it and, and good luck telling that person how can, they can improve. That's why we need humble people. The, the really talented, advanced photo majors they don't want to listen, right? And if they don't want to listen, I don't want to talk to them. Or, or they want to pick the assignments that they go on. Yeah, right? or they're too good for an assignment. I love people that are raw and want to learn. Yeah. So what educational photo programs does BYU have that allows you to grab so many talents? Uh, a lot of times we don't hire photo majors. We have a lot of advertising majors, you know, marketing, engineering, everything. Uh, Bio we do have some biology. photo majors. Yeah. I mean, we have them all over the spec. Rarely do we hire photo majors. Do you ever take somebody who's like, wow, what does a camera look like? Uh, yeah, we, we absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. If they have the right attitude, we can teach anybody photography. And we've had some, before we used to have more secretary jobs as well, where they helped run the office. And we've and really had no idea how to use a camera. And we've had some of them transition to a photographer role just from being in the office long and, and them coming and helping on shoots and taking portraits for us, uh, a lot of stuff like that, that they're like, hey, I would love to uh, make that jump. And so we absolutely um, help them make that transition. We're kind of at the point where every, we hire a photographer now. Whether or not they know photography or not, we're training them to be a photographer. So you're training them with the YouTube videos, training guides, other students? Because I, I worry about that. Sometimes I get those students in, know a little bit. Yeah. They may have a few good pictures of a yeah. portfolio, but then they can't get the camera off the bottom. Yeah, and that's and that's what comes next. That's what we're going to talk about. It's the one-on-one, -on -one, really. Um, the mentorship that I had while I was in college with Jaren and Nate is still relevant and beneficial today. There was a semester um, during which I was dealing with some just personal life circumstances and school things that were just difficult for me. We didn't have a super long conversation, but some of the life advice that they shared with me um, is still something that I think about to this day and still something that really helps me personally. Remember I went on, I think one shoot with Jaron for a soccer game and he kind of showed me the ropes and then that was it. Uh, the rest of the, all the other games I ever went on, I was basically on my own and I was thrown into the fire. Um, I went and shot a BYU volleyball game and took around 6,000 photos, came back to the office, and Jaron Wilkie was sitting there and we went through all 6,000 of them. And then I would come back from shoots and that next day he would go over the shoot with me and tell me what I did wrong, what was not good, and tell me good shots that I had. And he pretty much told me all of them were terrible and rightfully so, they were terrible. Um, and at the end of it, I was feeling really discouraged because I didn't get around one photo that was acceptable or good. He looked at me and said, you know, here's what, was, what went wrong, and now what are we going to do to get better? Also encouraging me that I, I am doing well, but also showing me where I can improve. And as terrifying as, I, as those reviews were with Jaren, they were so helpful. And I think just that kind of set the expectation for the rest of my time there at BYU Photo. I'll never forget that. We sat down and made goals, and instead of being discouraged leaving that meeting, I was really 
excited to go forward and I signed up for the next volleyball game. I remember a summer working at BYU Photo where both of the full-time employees were gone for three weeks and it was up to us students to run the office on our own. I don't think us students could have ever successfully run an office by ourselves if we hadn't been mentored along the way and taught how to think for ourselves. I'm just really grateful for and I really appreciate mentors that are willing to do whatever they can to help me succeed both professionally and personally because if you're doing well personally then most likely you're going to be able to succeed even more in your profession. Anytime I can call them up and ask them advice obviously for my career my profession but even just in life and I know that they're going to be able to give me um, solid answers or lead me in the way to help me come up with the best answers for myself. The question was, do we have team trainings and how often do you meet, how often do we meet one-on-one -on -one with the students? Okay, we have a weekly staff meeting during fall winter. Uh, it's usually half an hour. And again, that's mostly calendaring meeting. We try to plan our calendar two weeks out. Of course, there's stuff that happens last minute. We always try to leave a photographer available for those last minute things because they happen every single day, right? But we try to get two weeks out so that they can plan their lives and we can plan our life, right? Okay, you're gonna get the baseball game, you're gonna get the soccer game, try and get all that set up. Um, and then at, at that meeting, we clean up any problems. Like, hey, we're noticing people are not, you know, filing things correctly or your, your fridge is dirty or whatever. We try to do some, some, some maintenance during that time. Or, hey, why aren't your images renamed and they're on the server? Yes, that too. Or why haven't you entered the MIC yet? Um, but it's, it's really the spring and the summer that we do the majority of our training. We have more time to do one-on-one -on -one and group trainings. In the spring and summer, right now, we're doing two staff meetings a week for two hours each. And we let the students determine the curriculum. They come to us and say, we want to learn X, Y, or Z. We're going to go work on outdoor lighting. We're going to work on you know, Photoshop or ingesting or whatnot. And uh, we try to, you know, if there's something we feel like there's a big gap, we say, hey, we should really talk about this. Um, and those, those spring summer training sessions are amazing. And that's where we see the most growth. Because uh, we get to do a deep dive on like, a lighting principle or whatnot. And on top of that, the students that are already with us, they train those, those other students. New students go as second shooters or assistants on shoots for the first several months. They, we don't send them out on their own until we feel comfortable that they are, can handle it, right? But a lot of that initial training doesn't come from us. It comes from the other students who are more than capable to train. Yes, Matt? What is your average length of time that a student works with you? Uh, three years. Okay. We usually hire, we hire freshmen or sophomores, and we, we, we say it takes a year to really fully train somebody. So we're looking for the long-term people. Now some we've had longer, though. Some have had longer. Which is great. <laughs> I'm, I'm going on 22, so. Um, <laughs> no, 24, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, we love it. We love it when they want to be there for a long time and they commit to it. So yeah, that brings a good point. Like, we really try to hire them as freshmen as best we can. I mean, it's, I don't know, it's hard to hire a senior and try to, even though they may have experience from the classroom or doing their own freelance stuff, it's hard to, to train them to do what we do in our office and just to have them graduate. So again, it's an investment, but there's not much return on that. Um, and so the, as much as we can, we hire them while they're young, and then they'll stay with us throughout the time of... Is that, is that a stipulation of the job? No, no not necessarily. No, no, it's... Can you tell them, like, you know, if you're a freshman, what we expect them to stay with us? We, we no. ask them if they'd like to be with us for that time period. For the, we, we said, we would love to hire you and have you stay with us your whole college career, okay. you know? How do you keep the summer? Uh, we pay them. A lot of them want to stay for the training. So not all can do it, obviously, um, but a lot of them want to stay. So we, we try to make it so that the summer, spring summer is fun. It's, we, we, it's, it's like a master class in photography. That's what it is. Yes, back here. How do you convince your administration and HR to give them raises? Uh, that's not a problem for us. I'm in charge of that. It's not a problem. <laughs> it, it, they, they see what they are creating. They see the value they're bringing in. It's never been a problem. That's so. been something that's really nice is having the trust of the administration, which is something that it's not something that happens overnight, right? So Mark and Jaron have done that for years and years and years. So administration just, they trust us to do what we feel we need to do. I had one more question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, do you pay them by the hour or is it $99? Pay them by the hour, $99 an hour. Uh, usually, I mean, it's, it's definitely going up now. <laughs> Some questions, okay. Um, we have no openings for you guys. Um, right now, 
It's going up, I think, with you know everybody's job on campus going up. It's probably 13 an hour probably to start. Yeah. And I'm usually giving them an hour, a dollar raise a year. The people that have been with us for three years are 16, 17, which is pretty good for a college student, yeah. but not good when you compare it to what they can go off campus and get. So they're there not just for the money, they're there because they want to be a part of what we're doing and, and learn, right? Yeah. So, okay, uh, sorry, we had one more. Yes, go ahead. Everything and everything. So the first three months, really, a student is just a second person. They go on shoots. They, go, they would be a second shooter or an assistant on shoots. They will go as a third person or a lighting assistant or whatever. They just try to soak as much as they can in because there's just so much information, so much new stuff. So they work really, really hard to just do that. We also will sit down with them, especially the first six months, with any shoot that they do, we'll go through with them every photo and give them feedback. And the way that we do this is, again, this is how I, I was taught by Mark, is you sit down, go through the shoot, and say, okay, at the end, you can't just be critical. You just say, what did you do well? What can you do better? Because you always do something right, and you always do something wrong. I mean, I, every time I do a shoot, I, it's the same thing. I did this right, this is horrible, right? Because if you just focus on the negative, you're gonna get depressed, you're gonna get discouraged, you're gonna quit. But if you focus on, look, I'm making progress, but here's where I wanna continue to get better in. That's the one-on-one -on -one that we spend with them, uh, and especially, like I say, that first six months or so is critical for us to give them that feedback. They'll, even the other students will sit down and do that with them, and, and I it's think, great. I think that's probably one of the most important parts of, and it's the one that's honestly, it's the hardest, because it takes the most amount of time. Yep. And so it's not convenient by any means, and if you don't schedule and invest that time, it's not gonna happen, because it's really not convenient, especially when we're in a rush. But that is where you probably will see the biggest growth in them, is sitting through, going through their photos, and don't overwhelm them. Don't say, okay, your composition's horrible. Okay, remember the rule of thirds? You remember hearing about that? Why is that person's face right in the center of the frame in all of these shots? Like, don't overwhelm them. Go through and give them two or three things to work on. Okay, next shoot, I want you to work on composition, your exposure is all over the place, so let's, let's work on that. And then let's focus on just your framing, you know, watching your edges along with your composite. Just give them you know, two or three things to work on. Let them work on that, improve on that, and then when they come back, just keep building. building and you that. have to follow through. You can't say work on this and then ignore it the next time. Oh, yep. look, you, your composition is so much better. See how much you've improved since this last week? Yep, positive You're building reinforcement. Them up, right? So this is build on Steven's question. So then you ever like walk in the office and like, you discover that some student has asked some other student, hey, how'd you do that cool picture I saw? And the next thing you know, these two students are just in the studio together and just here. Like, yep. This, your flight, your it's, it, it happens, especially now that we have a studio, it happens all the time. Hey, can I sh show you how to do that? You know, it's great. Students have, the training. Students yeah. have the, and they're empowered to train. And in fact, we ask the senior ones, we want you to take this person under your wing and help them. And I mean, that light, they light up, they're excited, they're ready to go. They're like, oh, I'm not the, I'm not the, the young one anymore. I can or, finally start being a teacher. Or they're super nervous about it because now they have this responsibility placed on their shoulder, but they usually answer the call and step up their game. Mm -hmm. How many hours a week do they usually work and would you rather have one person do that amount of time or just have two split it if you can only hire that many hours? Um, 18 to 20 hours during football they can have an exemption like football home game weeks they can go up to 25 but then we have to balance it out later. You know it's just the, it's just the amount of hours government wise that we can pay them without paying insurance. Um, but spring summer is different. Spring summer they can work full time 40 hours uh, and, and, it, and it balances out so they don't go over their 26 you know for insurance. Um, Right now, we can hire students. We can't hire full-timers, but we can hire a bunch of students, and we're going to hire students, and we're going to train them. We're going to we're going to we're going to get the best out of them. So, um, I honestly, it takes work, but my students I'll put up against most full-timers. So, so, are they outside of a federal work study program, or they're just student employees? They're, so they're limited that what, 26 hours average per year for Obamacare before you have to pay them insurance. So they're under, under that umbrella. So okay. they are limited on what they can do. But yeah, so if, if they go over a certain amount of hours for the year, they can't sure. keep working. We have to stop, they have to stop working at a certain point, right? I don't know if you guys run into that. I'm sure well, you do. We have to do a federal work study and we can only have 10 hours. Yeah, that's, hours. no, we're not under that, so. Okay. Yeah. We can only keep students for 18 months. Yeah, and that's weird. Tell, 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 tell them something's weird. <laughs> well, no, I think it's, it might be a Michigan State law. Yeah, it, it might be a state thing. It's not, not an issue for us. Wh yeah. which, which in 
a situation like this and with mentoring, that makes it very difficult because you only have 18 months with them. That would be very, and you can't rehire. Can't rehire, is that correct? Um, I've got one that I'm trying to do right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll find out. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I do want to mention in this section before we move on is I, anybody that knows me knows that I do not put up with excuses. I hate, I hate excuses. Because when you make an excuse, you give up all of your power, right? And what we train them to do is, is I don't want excuses, I want questions. And I don't care if they ask the same question 100 times, that's way better than an excuse one time. Um, and from the beginning, that's how we teach them, we train them. Um, we have, a, we have a, a talk from our university, it's called Be 100% Responsible, that it's, it's like our Bible. You are going to be accountable for your actions. If you make a mistake, fess up to it, great. Learn, move on, but don't ever make an excuse. And uh, that's something we, we drill into them. The other um, question we get a lot is the MIC. Uh, I think the monthly image competition is awesome. One of these things is not like the other. Yeah. I don't know if you guys see that. Beautiful. The question I got was, how do you what do you do to prepare your students to enter the MIC? And I, and I appreciate the question, but it's the wrong question. This is the question. How do you use the MIC to improve your photography? So MIC, monthly image competition, yeah. just to, mm -hmm. for those that. Yeah, I, th I think the monthly image competition, I think a lot of people don't see the big picture of what it is. They look and they see competition. It's, it, the competition's great, whatever. The, the MIC is an opportunity to become a better photographer. And the reason for that is, is you have free feedback from professional photographers that do what you do to tell you if the, your image is good or not. That's awesome. And that's, that's what we use as a tool to train our students. There are a couple reasons why I really enjoyed the MIC. One was that it helped me learn how to break down an image and see what was really working in that image and how I could apply it to my photography. The second one would be, I love the schedule. Um, every month, I knew that there was going to be a new batch of images to compete against, and it kept me on my toes, and it kept me having something to work towards every single month. The best part of the monthly image competition is the voting process. I was able to see work around the U.S. and to think about each image critically instead of passively, like I normally would do on social media. For us at BYU Photo, the monthly image competition gave my mentors, Darren and Nate, a really great opportunity to talk us through as students what made some of the images so successful that month and what made other ones that we thought maybe were going to do really well not do as well as we thought and how we could improve our own work. And so now in my first post-graduation job, I actually have an opportunity to every once in a while review a photographer's portfolio and talk them through images that I really love and other ways that they could improve their work. And I definitely would not be able to do that and have those skills if I didn't have the experience I did with the monthly image competition and with the opportunity it provided for Jaren and Nate to really teach us the principles of what makes a good image and how we can get better. You know, as a creative, especially as a photographer, the more you make, the better you get. And this was just one thing that helped me want to make, want to do more and try new things. It's just really helped me grow as a creative is by pumping out more work and fine tuning my craft. So I remember when the mix started, it was 2004. I was a young photographer and I could never win a competition. I could never place a print. And I always wanted to like, I wanted to get up to that level where these, you know, heroes of mine were. And when the mix started, I'm like, this is awesome. It's an opportunity for me to, every month, submit something and see how I'm doing. And I remember starting off by submitting and just nothing, nothing, nothing. And it just motivated me. It says, OK, I'm not there yet. I'm going to work hard every single month to find the images that I can submit. And little by little, I started placing some images, started making some progress. And I'll tell you, it was just so cool. Like, my mentors, these guys that I look up to think this is a good image. That was empowering. It was amazing. And I'm just telling you right now, I would not be the photographer I am today without the monthly image competition. There's no way I would have won Photographer of the Year without the monthly image competition. There's no reason, no reason for me to be up here talking if it weren't for the monthly image competition. It made a huge difference in my professional development. And that's why it's an amazing tool for my students to grow too. They love it. Um, what we do with the MIC is we challenge them. It says, you have the opportunity to have professional photographers at other universities in this country judge your work every single month. That's an opportunity you have to take advantage of, and we force them to do it. You gotta get your four images in. 
and we constantly talk to them about it. They ask us for feedback. Which one should I enter? You know, and that's, that's awesome. We also sit down with our group every, at the end of the month when the winners come out, and we go through every single image, and we talk about them. And this is, I think, where some of the best learning happens. Mm -hmm. What made this image successful? Why did this win? Why did photographers vote for this versus this fifth place one? You know, or what, what do you like, or what would you do to improve this image even more? And it's really a good way for us to break down the photo, to start talking about compositional rules, to talk about light theory, to talk about color, and really take a deep dive into dissecting a photo. <coughs> And I'm telling you, it's, we've had some of our best talks about photography by talking about the MIC. Um, when they're on shoots, we challenge them, go out, find something for the MIC. It's something that you, you are proud to put your name on and put out there. And they get out of it what they're willing to put into it, right? Um, one of my students just got first place last month with a, a really beautiful dancer image. She started entering several months ago and was very frustrated that she kept on seeing, oh, 22 of 22 on her images, you know? And then, she pushed herself, she pushed herself, she wanted to get better. And little by little, got better and better, and now she's finally won first place. And she was just so happy when she won, so happy. She's like, I finally, I finally got an image that, that people like. And it, I did all this extra hard work and it paid off. Guys, the Mick is amazing. And I, I, I just want to invite everybody, I hope you as yourselves would enter, I still enter because it makes me better every day. But your students need to take advantage of it. And I'm so glad that we're, we're now students are available to be able to participate in the MIC because all of these students that you've seen here, as soon as the MIC was available, they started participating and they had such a great experience in, in it. What, I had a question about the MIC, yeah? Um, is your office paying for the uh, EPA membership? We are paying, yes, I will pay for the memberships. I'll also pay for the print entries, of the, uh, the, the entries for the competition at the end of the year. And, uh, and my boss is behind me on that. She's like, this is helpful. This is professional development. They're professionals. Let's develop them. So it's, it's been very good. Um, when, it, uh, when it comes to voting, I also think, we, and I haven't mentioned this, I think voting is very important too. Because when you vote, you have to be critical. You have to really think about the photo. It's not, as the student said, just swiping on Instagram. And we tell them, you know, definitely, when you see our images, you don't vote automatically sevens. You, you judge us just the same as you judge everybody else. Have your integrity and make sure that you are, are trying to help them be better too. That, because that's what they're doing with your images. And I'm telling you, uh, both by judging and entering the MIC, it will help, it will just improve their skills and their appreciation for the craft, leaps and bounds. Okay, any other questions before we move on to responsibilities? Okay, so the question was asked if they cover all aspects of campus or if they specialize in certain things like athletics or performing arts. And uh, our students cover everything. So they're like even football photo shoots, right? They're there with us and we, we have them photograph the promotional stuff for football, which is the highest profile stuff other than maybe things for the president, probably even more than the president. More people see uh, it. And, uh, but we include them in all that. Now, we don't just throw some kid in there who doesn't know what they're doing, right? We, we include that in part of the training, the process, the getting them ready. So yeah, it's gonna stretch them and they'll probably be really nervous about it, but we're there with them or somebody who can help them is there with them and we just walk them through it. You know, there's a lot of dance shoots, you know, that we'll do and we have the iPad, right? And I'll just sit down next to them and they're photographing and be like, hey, you know, just pay attention to watch your feet are getting a little bit close. You're cutting them off on the bottom. So just watch your framing. And, or you got to just wait for the moments. Like instead of just motoring through this whole dance move, just watch it. And then when you see a moment, be very intentional about the photo you take. Instead of taking 50 photos, take like three of that one. Because there's only one, you know, peak of the dance move. So you're just, you're just there with them. You're guiding them through the process. Um, so yeah, like Jaron was saying earlier, we pretty much, it takes about a year to train a student to where we feel comfortable with sending them on anything. And, uh, and it's very nice to be able to have students in a position where if something comes up and we're out of town or out of the country or whatever and something needs to happen with the president, we feel very confident that, hey, can you go take care of this? Can you photograph, you know, go to the president's office and photograph this for him? Or even if we're sending them like if we have multiple sports that are on the road, all in tournaments, and we're both gone on a tournament, but then men's volleyball is going, like, yeah, we can send a student to that. And we feel very confident that they're gonna get what they need to. Um, 
And then there, there was a question about um, kind of workflow, archiving, all of that. Our students see the process from beginning to end. Like there is, there is nothing that they don't do. So they're going to ingest, they're going to rename, they're going to, you know, cull their images, they're going to rename metadata, put it on photo shelter, upload it to the server, deliver it to the client. They're involved in the whole process. Um, emailing the clients, working back and forth with them. We treat them like a full-time staff photographer. We give them those responsibilities. Do you have a question? I just wanted to um, talk about the, so the relationship they have with all these aspects of campus, right? Um, athletics, a lot of the times, I imagine, uh, for our universities are their own kind of beast and entity. Um, what are some ways that you have found over the years to partner more with athletics or these more segmentized aspects of campus so that, um, because I feel like an intern under your guys' tutelage would be more skilled and ready to even do some of those things, as opposed to having like two specialized, you know, I only shoot uh, soccer, right, or this person only shoots dance. How did that, I guess, administrative relationship cultivating happen so that, I guess I imagine they also have some interns that maybe do some things? Are you talking about athletics? That yeah, they athletics. We shoot all of the athletics for photos. Oh, okay. So we, we provide all the photography for yeah. athletics. So, so I know so. some places, for example, when I was at UVU, marketing communications, we were not the athletics primary photographers, but we usually went to X amount of games to get all the marketing material for them. So we weren't the athletic shooters. They just had students that kind of did their work. But yeah, here at BYU, we are the athletics photographers as well. And so that relationship is kind of already there. There's uh, athletics, social media teams, and, and different things that they kind of do their own thing under the umbrella of athletics, but photo-wise, we cover that as well. I would say every once in a while you run into, oh, I don't want a student, I want you. And, and I just say, well, you're getting a student. You know, <laughs> it's, I can't be everywhere, and we've developed a good relationship with these people, and they know and they trust them. So I, I, very rarely do I have any issues with a student showing up. Um, unless they really do a bad job, and then that's a good learning opportunity, which we take advantage of. Yep, so. yep absolutely. Any other questions before we move on? Let's Please. Think, like they did do a bad job. They're early. They need you to reshoot. How do you tackle it? We don't talk about Bruno. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, it's hard. I had that happen to me when I was a student. Mm -hmm. I had the wrong setting, flash curtain, cut the images, of the, all the portraits for new faculty in half, and it was the worst feeling I ever had. As I'm sitting in the dark room looking at the black and white film strip saying, what's wrong with this? And Mark's like, I know what's wrong with it. <laughs> um, and I'm telling you, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't kind about it. He's like, go reshoot it. And that is the, the shoot I dreaded more than any shoot in my life. But I've never made that mistake again. So it's a learning opportunity. And you just be kind and, and have grace. And you know, it's just, we're human. And we're asking these students to do big things. Um, we try to put them in positions to, to succeed, and when they fail, we help them succeed. So I wish, uh, I wish you guys, some of you know who Gabe is. He was one of our students, and he went on to UVU, and now he does all of UVU's social media. Um, anyway, he had an experience where it was, uh, it, it got a little heated, where, and he was a new student, and he was going to cover the senior day for women's soccer. And there was a miscommunication, and he was not there when he needed to be and where he needed to be, and those photos did not happen. And one of the associate athletic directors just ripped into him. And he came back and he was like, he was mortified of the whole experience. And, uh, and she was, I think she was trying to call him. I don't remember the whole story. Anyway, long story short, that was one of the most pivotal and defining moments in his career. And what happened you know, what, what at the moment was so devastating, working with him and him working with that associate athletic director built like such a strong relationship that she calls him to do everything for her. Like All of her family portraits? Family she portraits. Him. She just got her PhD or something and she hired him to do it. Like, and it ended up being such a great relationship that came out of that. So just because people fail, like that's, honestly a good thing because that's when we learn well we all if we learn from it it's not a failure right but i don't know that's where a lot of the growth happens is when they fail and there's those bad experiences and it's probably really uncomfortable sometimes for us and for them when you but said they work together did you all get in a, in a 
There was talking. There was talking. There was some back and forth. No, they mostly worked it out. Um, we talked yeah. to her. She talked to him. It was it was fine. I mean, it, it was not great, but it it was fine. And, you know, and one of those things that yeah, it's a little tense there, but we all learned something from that. But you have to fail successfully. Yeah, and and part of it was responsibility on us. Like we didn't do a good enough job of making sure and following up with him and letting him know. Like a lot of that fell on us, and so we had to take responsibility for that too. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we have a talk. We have a talk, and I ask them, do they want to still be here? Um, and it's frank, and I don't, I don't think I've ever fired somebody. Um, I have encouraged somebody to maybe they need to think about if they really want to be here or not. Um, and they ended up leaving in a little bit while later, and, you know, it was probably for the best. But we've been, we've been very lucky that it's worked out almost all the time. And, you know, and they're students, right? They're college students. They're going to have life issues. They're going to have things happen. And we're pretty patient. We're pretty understanding. We were there. We understand. Uh, but accountability is everything in our office. And uh, generally, if, if, if they're accountable, they're not going to make it to that point. So, and you bring up a really, a really interesting and good point, the difference between a boss and a mentor, right? If we really care about those students and we really want them to succeed, we've got to talk to them. We've got to have those hard conversations because if we don't, if there's correction that needs to be made and we don't make that correction, who are we thinking about? We're thinking about ourselves, right? We're not thinking about them. And so sometimes we really have to have those hard conversations and uh, we got we to gotta make correction where correction needs to be made. And it's not because you're an idiot, you need to do a better job. It's because I, I want you to succeed. And if we can approach it that way, like, hey, I want you to succeed. Like, and we understand and have seen the results of you know, lack of accountability and different things and what that can lead to. And if we want them to be able to, I don't know, be better than that and change, uh, we, have a, we have our hands full, but it's worth the investment. And again, it's because we care. We care about their future. We care about them as a person. And they'll feel that when we talk to them, if we genuinely care. They'll feel it. And they'll know, I, you're right. And you ha they have, they'll, you know, they'll feel, they have my best interest in mind. Like, they just want me to do better, and uh, I can do that. I can do that. We should have one question back here. Okay. Uh, we just have a couple quick things. We have, you know, seven minutes. We'll try and get through a few and answer a couple more questions. All right, Jaron, schedule. Schedule. I think, we, I think we covered that. Hours yeah. of, you know, we try to balance it out. I do like also say, hey, I need one night a week, you're always available. And so I have always on Thursday, that person's always available. And they try and reschedule their life so they're always available. And that helps with especially sporting events, you know, Thursday, Saturdays or Friday, Saturday games. Okay, I know he can cover it. That's his night. That's, that's his night. This other night, he's got class, but this night, he's available. Um, that helps me. And again, two weeks in advance, we try to balance everything out. Uh, something we didn't mention, students do all of our portraits. 99% of our portraits are shot by our students. Uh, that takes a huge load off of me and Nate. I, it's a, we have a permanent portrait studio in our office. They just have to walk in and flick the lights on. And it's really easy to be consistent, and they can take care of that, and it trains them. It helps them become better photographers, that personal interaction, posing, all that kind of stuff. That's one of the first things they get trained on. In fact, new people, that's their primary job, portrait photographer. So, um, but yeah, schedule, we just try to make it work. It's hard. When you say portraits, do you mean portraits or do you mean headshots? Headshots. headshots. Portraits. That's kind of like a swear word in our office. We try not to use that terminology. Yeah. Because if you are, you know, interacting with other people outside of this profession, you talk about headshots, or I'm going to go shoot the president, different things yeah. like that. Like, so we try to change our terminology in office so when we're out of office, we don't say the wrong thing when security's around. Studio or, portrait. You know. But yeah. then also we'll train them for on-location portraits, available light portraits, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that's their, the first point, studio portraits, great place to start, great place to get jump into the discussion. How many headshots are you all doing like per month? Oh. We don't do any headshots per month. We do a lot of portraits, though. Um, <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I couldn't give you a number. I'd say probably, it changed. It depends on the month, like September, October is much crazier than now. Anywhere from 50 to 100, 150 or 200. It just depends on the time of year. After COVID, of course, there was that glut of people that came in that had been waiting, you know, to take their mask off. So it, it varies. I wish I knew the number. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so over here. Um, so 
still use like that any certain type of system to communicate? Uh, we have text. Text. We have a text chain, and uh, yeah, mostly text. They don't want anything else. We've tried a few other things, and they're like, just text me. <laughs> Come on, old man, get on it, you know? Um, but no, it's, texting seems to work the best for us. They respond quickly. They sometimes did just do emojis, and we just try to figure out what they're saying. You know, it's good. <laughs> no, but. Are most of your students interchangeable, so you could, they could do anything? Well, it depends on their experience. Okay. Um, we, don't let, we don't like assign you shoot just athletics, or you just shoot you know, banquets. Some of them like specializing in things, and you know, but we want them to be able to do everything. Yeah, uh, I'd much rather they were trained in everything, so that when I'm in a bind, I'm not saying, "Oh, I can't," because this person can't do that. So that's part of the training process. Yes, back here. With with the number of students you have, five to eight, and just schedule, just taking the time to schedule all the shoots for all those students, how do you have time to do? So I don't. Um, when I took over as the head you know, of the department a couple years ago, I remember, I went, and some of you know Carrie Jenkins, my boss, she's just a sweetheart. She's the nicest person on the planet. And I just went in and had a little wine session. You know, I'm like I, I, like, I miss shooting. Like, all I'm doing is going to meetings, and I'm all, all I'm doing is scheduling. And, and she is so nice, but she closed the door. <laughs> and she's like, the most direct she's ever been with me in her entire life. And she's like, Jaron, don't you think I'd rather be writing articles for the magazine? And I'm like, whoa, OK. She's like, this is the job. Your job is to, is to make it so that they can be successful. That's the job. And yeah, I understand exactly what you're feeling, but that's the job. Give them opportunities to succeed. And I've taken that to heart. I'm not shooting as much as I'd like to shoot. I'm not doing as many things as I'd like to do. But I'm trying to give them the opportunity so that they can have that success. Uh, and yeah, it means I have to step back. It's hard. <laughs> well, and, and go, sorry, going to like the actual scheduling part, a lot of times, depending on what the shoot is, we put that responsibility on the students. So, yeah. and, and kind of the way that we have it set up with our email, we have our main BYU photo email box, and then all the students and myself and Jaron have our own folders in there. And so we give them assignments just by dragging the email to their box. So very first thing when they come in, they're trained. Look at my email. And then if somebody has called and requested or emailed and requested something, if it's in their box, they're responsible for it. Yeah. They take care of the details. They'll take care of the scheduling and everything like that. Well, I'll do the initial kind of talk and set. And sometimes I have to do a little bit more. But uh, I, once it's in their court, I want them to have that experience of running the whole shoot because that's what they will have as a professional. Sorry, right, right here first? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what kind of hierarchy have you developed in your student photographers? Or are they all kind of on the same level? No, I usually have a lead student photographer, the one that's experienced and is really good at mentoring. They're the kind of the, the ringleader. And when we leave, they're the one in charge. Um, but often we leave, and then we send them out elsewhere, and then they're out elsewhere. And they have to have a little bit of independence and do their own thing. But yeah, we do have the, the more experienced ones. Definitely, we put more of a leadership responsibility on them. And they're happy to accept it. They're, and, they're great. And the nice thing is, we don't have to choose that person. They stand out themselves. Yeah. And so the ones that, that take charge and are good leaders, like they'll, they'll shine. And you'll know who they are. And those are the ones that. And often they're the ones that went and trained those new people anyway. So there's already that relationship of a mentor. So over here. What percentage of uh, your daily work then is still shooting, would you say? Depends on the time of year. Depends on the day. I Five? don't know. I mean, it's, it changes every day wildly. I, I, I really couldn't say. I mean, I do two or three shoots a day, maybe. You know, sometimes I'm doing six or seven. Or but sometimes, not, sometimes we don't have any. Yeah, and we're I, just post-processing or. I mean, I know I shot. And... I know I shot 400,000 images last year, so I'm still shooting. Um, but I'd have to go look at the number on our spreadsheet to know exactly what that number is. But I, I mean, I'm still shooting. I definitely am giving. I. Yeah, I mean, I can pull it up right now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, I mean, we we'll look it up. Um, but I still shoot, but I definitely don't shoot as much as I'd want to. I'd much rather shoot than go to a meeting. But I have to go to the meeting to communicate to get us the opportunities to shoot. That's the whole deal, right? Okay, a student gets sick. They have a project. Yeah. Family members coming. Is it yep. their responsibility to find a replacement? Or how does that work? That's you, the thing we, we, they usually will text the group of the whole group and say, hey, I just came down sick. Can anybody take care of this? And if they're in a, incapacitated, yeah, we'll of course take over. Yeah. But yeah, we want them, they can't be accountable if they just 
just throw it down on the ground, right? We yes. want them to follow through. So going back to that talk that Jaren was referencing, being 100% responsible, is something we teach our students, hey, you, if you can't do this or you have this assignment in your box, you are still responsible to make sure that it gets done. Whether you have to pass that on to somebody else, you are still responsible for it. Yeah. How's your uh, office situation working with students? I haven't gotten any. Do y'all have desks for everyone? Or we have enough space for all of them to be in at the same time. We just moved into a new studio, plenty of space. It's been a, it's been a blessing because before we did not. Those we were, that visited our office before. We were before, in a closet. We didn't have a studio before, actually. Everything we did, we shot on location. Uh, so we've only been in the studio for a year and a half, and it has changed that. It's made it a much better teaching environment because, like say, you can throw everything down and go in the studio and teach the technique in five minutes instead of trying to sneak into a room that's not being used and, you know, get kicked out by the janitor. Um, yeah, thankfully, uh, our university believes in mentoring. It's obvious, right? That they, we have way more student employees than full-time employees. They want us to mentor them. They also want them to have opportunities to earn money so they don't go into big-time debt going to college. Because of that, we have institutional support to do what we need to do to mentor. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge blessing. Um, last question, and then we're done. Oh, good, There's, that, was, that was the last question. One more, go. Um, you said something earlier about photo log. What's the photo log? Oh, the shoot log. Shoot log. Yes, go on. Uh, I have an article. Uh, we have a YouTube uh, video about shoot log. It's how we track all of our shoots. Um, talk to me after. Yeah, we'll we can we'll get you hooked up too. on it. Um, makes a huge difference, and uh, it's a way to be organized in an easy, quick way. And to keep track of all of your stats throughout the years. So it gives you a tool to take to administration to say, hey, I need more help. Yep. Well, guys, we're so appreciative. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, guys.